Good morning and welcome to another day looking at God's Word and we're going to be reading from Revelation chapter 21 and then I'm going to say a few words from from God's Word. So let's read that, Revelation chapter 22, sorry, Revelation 22 verses 1 to the end of the Bible. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There'll be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had, been, who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. And then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this prophecy. He who, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the prophets searched intently and carefully to find the time, timing and the person who was to come, who we now know is the Lord Jesus. And angels long to look into these things. Heavenly Father, please give us that same, same keen expectation for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, help us to worship you with our hearts and minds and soul. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe as we've been looking at heaven and we've been thinking about what life might be like in heaven... Uh, you've come up with some questions and one question that came up in my Bible study group just last week was about marriage and family. And we're certainly spending a lot of time together with our families in this strange period of history. We had Mother's Day last week and in fact uh, the person that asked this question in our Bible study group, it was the anniversary of her mother's passing. And so this was a, this was a really uh, uh, a big question for her. 
Now, we were in our group, we weren't looking at uh, the book of Revelation, but we were looking at that passage in Mark chapter 12 where the Sadducees come to Jesus and try to trick him with a question about the resurrection. And the Sadducees were an elite group of Jews. They were a minority sect. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They believed that this world is all there is. And they only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. And one of them put a question to Jesus about a particular law in the book of Deuteronomy, which said that if a man's brother dies, then the brother who's unmarried and alive, if there is such a brother, has a responsibility to marry the widow of his brother. And this is called Leverite marriage, or, and Leverite just means brother-in-law. And the Sadducees came to Jesus smugly and put it to him, what happens if this happens seven times, seven marriages, each of those men, the brothers dies, who's, who's this woman going to be married to in the resurrection? Of course, they think they're very clever. They think they've found a hole in Jesus' teaching. But Jesus gives a knockdown argument. He says to them, have you not read the Old Testament? In fact, in the book of Exodus, which you should believe in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to Moses saying, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the, live, not the, God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, implied in the scriptures in Exodus, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are alive. And they're alive as Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now, there are many other suggestions, if not proofs, of the afterlife in the Old Testament. And in fact, in those first five books of the Old Testament, which the Sadducees also ignored. And Jesus just picks this one example in the very words that God spoke at the burning bush. But the other thing that Jesus says is that there is no marriage in heaven. To quote him, he says, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And this is what got us thinking. And while this teaching is fine for some, for my friend in our Bible study group, it was an issue. It was difficult. And it's not just difficult if you're married. What about all our other, like sibling relationships, parental relationships? I said, I'd go away and have a think about it. It's a really interesting question. The answer is partly in the passage, in that Jesus affirms Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are still Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They are still the same people, individuals, Israelites, men with their own particular history and experiences. Even within a name, there is a whole lot of history and meaning for Jewish people. And actually, when we consider the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus was recognisable in his resurrection body to his disciples. He wasn't somebody else when he came back from the dead. In fact, he even had the scars of the, the crucifixion in his body. I was talking with my older daughter and she summarised it like this. I was talking, talking with her about this, this very topic. And she said, Dad, in heaven we have eternal life, not new life. I think that's a good way to think about it. New life begins when we're born anew of the Holy Spirit. Um, when, we go, when we die and go to heaven, eternal life, which we already actually have now, continues. We're the same person. There's a lady from my church who survived the Holocaust. She's from Belgium. And she lived through the invasion of her country by the Nazis and witnessed some horrible, horrible things and the death of many members of her family. And she still remembers parts of what happened with tears in her eyes. It had a profound impact. When she gets to heaven, the scars will be there. Memories will be there. But with a perspective and a healing that's not going to cause tears in her eyes, but it will still be part of who she is. It is part of who she is, those experiences. She will be the same person. And her mother and father and siblings, if they are in Christ, will be there too. Marriage and family, our relationships, 
are what have made us who we are to a large extent, scars and no scars. You will be Kenyan if you are Kenyan, Chinese if you are Chinese, English if English. That's what I think from my reading of the, Rev of the book of Revelation because we read there that every tongue and tribe and nation will be there you know, with their own colours and customs. I find no evidence to believe otherwise. Yes, there will be no human marriage or giving of marriage and that's because marriage points towards the ultimate re relationship of which human marriage is a shadow. That is Christ and the church. So I won't be married to my wife, Xiang, but we will both be married to Christ. But I have every reason to believe that in heaven. In some ways, I'll be closer to my wife and kids and grandkids when and if they come than on earth. Our source of comfort isn't only that we will be with the Lord in heaven, but also that we'll be with each other. So I hope that helps. I shared that with our group. And I thought I'd also share it with you as it's re relevant to what we've been looking at in Revelation. Now, in the last two weeks, we've been given a preview of a magnificent future, a bride, unblemished, holy, radiant, and splendidly prepared for the Lord. The holy city of God, precious, strong, built on the foundations of the, uh, the Lamb and the Apostles. And the new heavens and the new earth, which is the dwelling place of God and his people. This is an overlapping picture. They're not separate realities. The bride and the city are the, are the people of God. The new creation and the temple are one and the same place. And what I've tried to point out in the last two talks is that the secular view of heaven, the cartoon picture of heaven, is closer to the biblical view of hell than heaven. The cartoon vision, a man or two men sitting on a cloud, isolated, silly, where everything revolves around their, their boredom, they speak with remorse, sometimes even with anxiety. That is not heaven. That is nothing like the vision that John sees in Revelation. Well, today we come to the end of the book where the vision of heaven continues in verses 1 to 5 before we come to the wrapping up of the book and the whole Bible in verses 6 to 21. There are three big ideas that I wanted to point out to you and they are fairly simple but profound. First is that Jesus rules. Secondly, in heaven we will worship God forever and thirdly, Jesus is coming back soon. The overwhelming message of the world is that Christianity is weak. But the overwhelming message of the Bible is that Jesus rules. That is how the Bible ends. That is the message of this last chapter. That is the message of this whole book. So John sees a vision of Christ. Listen to this description from chapter 1 where the book began. Among the lampstands, that's the churches, was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Jesus is standing in the midst of his people. He's, he's all seeing, he's all knowing, and he is the judge of the earth. Jesus is the centre of reality, not us. And thank goodness for that, that he is the centre, for we are incapable of ruling ourselves in the world. We've wrecked God's creation. We've tried to run the world our own way but failed to rule ourselves or each other. But Jesus has come and died as the Lamb of God, the sacrifice for our sins, to conquer death, to bring new life and to guarantee the new heavens and the new earth. And so Philippians chapter 2, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Is Jesus' rule good? Absolutely it is. Look at the picture in Revelation 22, verse 1 to 3. The angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. There is the river of life, the tree of life here at last at the end of history. We, we return to enjoy the tree of life from which we were banished at the beginning. It means we can live forever. There's no tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means there's no potential for sin anymore, no potential for going back to that chaos that we saw uh, and we, we experience, uh, saw, saw in the Bible and we experience in our everyday lives. There are 12 kinds of fruit here. There are no seasons for there's no moon or sun, but again, there are no, these are images it's an, and it's an image of abundance for the new creation is brimming with life. There'll no longer be any curse, verse 3. No death, but rather healing. Jesus rules. Secondly, in heaven, we will worship God forever. Verse 3, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. Or in other translations, it says worship him. We also find the same word in verses 8 to 9. I, John, am the, one, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and had seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll, scroll worship God. What does this mean practically to worship God forever? Does it mean an eternal church service? Well, I love church. I love coming to church when it's, when it's run well and the Bible is taught. I'm not against that. Uh, there will be praise. There will be joy and a great gathering of people from every nation and tribe and people and language. We will be together. It will be glorious. Revelation chapter 19 sounds like a massed choir singing hallelujah. You could imagine Handel's Messiah, the, you know, singing hallelujah to the Lord in, in heaven. But no, I don't think it's going to be an endless church service. That's not what the Bible teaches worship is. Worship is all of life for the Christian. It is church, it is singing, it is praying, it is fellowship, but it's not limited to church. It's an attitude which involves our thoughts and our wills and it, and, and it involves our words and actions and decisions. You worship God with your heart. And so when Jesus taught about holiness and worship in the Gospels, he criticised religious people for their failure of heart. They had the outward appearance of being, uh, of being um, a follower of God, but their hearts were far from him. And so Jesus said in the Gospels, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. And so Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Christian pastor and theologian who was murdered at the end of the, the Second World War by the Nazis, he said, if, and I'm going to read a, a longer passage, for, um, quote from him at the end, but he said, if you're a Christian, Jesus is not the tidbits, he's the bread. He's your food. He's what sustains you, keeps you alive. He, he's your lifeline and you, you think of Jesus like that. Germany, which was the centre of where the Reformation took place, the birthplace of the, the mission field in the 16th century to Europe, had become, at the start of the Second World War, an empty tomb. The German church at the time, the official church, had become liberal and just used the name Christian. 
And so when Hitler came along, they crumbled and had no courage and worshipped the Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler. Worship is of the heart. But also worship is outward and visible. And this sounds contradictory, but of course it's not for they connected. Love of God flows outwards from our hearts into actions. It's practical. It involves our mind thinking, what would please Jesus in this situation that I find myself in? And in the New Testament, religious or worship language is used to describe the whole of the Christian life. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. From Romans 12. And so now, as we will be in heaven, we worship God. When you go to work, when you go to church, the distinction between the sacred and the secular is not there for the Christian. When you go to the football, when you swim in the surf, you don't check in your Christianity. You're a worshipper the the whole time. When you go to the shops, you're a worshipper. When you do the ironing and fold the clothes, when you fix the back door, God doesn't go away or stop seeing us. You're a worshipper. Now, this doesn't mean that everything we do is of equal value. The body of Christ has many members and many gifts. There are a multitude of possibilities and occupations for the Christian. The golden thread that makes what we do of heavenly value is the two great commandments, to love God and to love your neighbour. Spend your time and energy in this life, or this is what we'll be doing in heaven, on what loves God and loves our fellow human being, our neighbour. And the Bible is chock full of passages that talk about love and what that means. Do those things which build others up or are more likely to build others up. Now, third big idea for today. Three times we read in these final verses the words from Jesus, I am coming soon. In verse 7, in verse 12, and at the end in verse 20. So we have the promise of the Lord Jesus himself the one who is the conquering king, whose words are trustworthy and true. I am coming soon. There are not too many certainties in life. And as you consider the next 20 years, even the next one or two years, there are many, many uncertainties, an infinite number of uncertainties. The return of Jesus is absolutely certain. And he is coming to judge, verse 12. Because he's the king. And that's what's involved in making everything perfect. And he's coming for his bride. We need to remember that soon does not mean immediately. There is a Greek word that does mean immediately and that's not the word that's used here. Rather, it means without unnecessary delay, at the first appropriate moment. There is no hesitation, there's no reluctance, there's no inability when the hour strikes. At that moment, Jesus will come. There's another scripture that comes to mind that helps us understand what, what's meant here, 2 Peter 3. And we learn 2 Peter 3, a letter written to a group of Christians who, who, who were unsettled by the coming of or the, or, or the absence of uh, Jesus' coming, wondering when he's coming back. They were unsettled. And we read there in chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. God's delay has a purpose and it is because of his massive compassion. He's still gathering people through the proclamation of the gospel into his kingdom. But the day of the Lord will come. So I want to bring this back down to earth. 
How should we then live? We have this wonderful vision, a preview of heaven. How does that reality change things now? We're told that Christ is coming soon. How then should we live? Seek first the kingdom. John is on the island of Patmos because of the word of God, we're told. He's in prison suffering because he's telling people about Jesus. And I pray that my life will be a witness like John and that I worship Jesus in all of life, trusting in him, being joyful in his forgiveness as I seek to make this good news known, trying to be holy through God's spirit and praying for courage to proclaim the good news that Jesus is Lord. That's what it means to be waiting for Jesus, to be seeking first the kingdom of God. Because we are not in heaven yet. Heaven is future. Now, in fact, is trouble and hardship and climate change and viruses and opposition and persecution. Don't be surprised at the difficulties and sufferings you face. Throughout the book of Revelation, we're called on to be patient and faithful, to patiently endure. We're promised suffering now, not fortune. So we're told in verse 7 to keep the words of the prophecy written in the scroll. Keep them on our minds, not to seal them up. This is to be constantly read and proclaimed and shared because we need this vision to to keep us hopeful and faithful in Jesus. There is a fundamental division in humanity. Two camps. We have it here in verse 11. There are two camps, the lamb and the beast Christ's followers and Satan's hordes, the New Jerusalem and the present but limited Babylon. And the book is saying all the time, who do you follow? Where do you live? Whose servants will you prove to be? Christ is the great unifier, but he is also the great divider. And verse 11 is saying that some people faced with Jesus want to go on doing evil, opposing and resisting Jesus. And they show that by who they are, by refusing to change their their true self. But despite that, the offer is still there. The doors are closing soon, but verse 17 is still there for those who hear this message and want to change. The spirit and the bride, the church, say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Come. Let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Now, you need to be be thirsty. You need to want to drink. And God will give you that if you pray to him. God draws us to himself by creating in us an emptiness, a need, a longing for more than this world can offer. And maybe you've come to that point. And if you have, then come to Jesus. Well, I wanted to finish with a quote from Bonhoeffer who who I referred to earlier. Um, He thought a lot about death. Um, He was a great writer and preacher. Uh, He was brave. He was in two different concentration camps before he was finally hung by the Nazis. Uh, A number of his family were killed fighting in the war and he died at quite a young age. And there was great sadness uh, right around the world when he was when the news of his death came through. Um, but for Bonhoeffer, death was not a sad thing. In fact, um, well, it certainly was not a time a, a time to despair. This is what he he wrote. This is what he preached actually from a sermon in London some years before his death, before he went back to Germany to serve his people. No one has yet believed in God and the kingdom of God. No one has yet heard about the realm of the resurrected and not been homesick from that hour, waiting and looking forward joyfully to being released from bodily existence. Whether we are young or old makes no difference. What are 20 or 30 years in the sight of God? And which of us knows how near or he or she may already be to the goal? That life, only really, that, ro- that life only really begins when it ends here on earth. That all that is here is only the prologue before the curtain goes up. That is for young and old alike to think about. Why are we so afraid when we think about death? 
Death is only dreadful for those who live in dread and fear of it. Death is not wild and terrible. If only we can be still and hold fast to God's word. Death is not bitter if we have not become bitter ourselves. Death is grace, the greatest gift of grace that God gives to people who believe in him. Death is mild. Death is sweet and gentle. It beckons to us with heavenly power. If only we realise that it's the gateway to our homeland, the tabernacle of joy, the everlasting kingdom of peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the forgiveness behind us. Thank you for your presence and fellowship with us. And thank you for the glory ahead of us. Give us biblical perspective. Deepen our hearts to believe this truth and to live for your kingdom. Forgive us for our incompetence and disobedience, complacency. Keep calling us back to live the heavenly life on earth. Forgive us for the weakness of our worship, the coolness, the lukewarmness. Stir us up privately and publicly that we might worship you as you deserve. Amen.